Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew Meredith from Model Partners, how are you going? Pretty good. Uh, some technical difficulties, but uh, happy to yes. be here as usual. Yeah, we're recording without video today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because normally we do this via Zoom, we hit record and then you can watch it on YouTube. But today it's audio only. Um, Drew's uh, in the office and has a few issues there, but that's okay. We're going to talk about Warren Buffett. He came out with uh, his annual letter recently and there were heaps of great quotes and anecdotes that come from that. But we're also just going to talk about Buffett, generally speaking, uh, given that his Berkshire Hathaway has returned over 3 million percent. Um, over the decades that he has been investing. So I think it deserves some attention. And Drew and I are going to share a few things that we each find really interesting about Warren Buffett, his investment strategy, some of the quotes, et cetera. They're not all necessarily from the recent letter, or at least mine aren't. Um, Drew hasn't told me his, so it's all um, <laughs> it's all open from here. Um, Drew, I thought maybe I'll go first because we we're just talking and I don't think you saw this one. Um, from the annual letter, uh, it, Warren Buffett says there's something called the orangutan effect. And I quote, he says, teaching like writing has helped me develop and clarify my own thoughts. Charlie calls this phenomenon, the orangutan effect. If you sit down with an orangutan and carefully explain it to one of, uh, one of your most cherished ideas, you may leave behind a puzzled primate, but will yourself exit thinking more clearly, end quote. So the basic idea is that if you explain an investment to someone else, um, even if they don't understand it, you'll probably find holes in your knowledge. And this is very s- similar to the Feynman technique named by uh, named after Richard Feynman, Professor Richard Feynman, physicist, and something that I follow when I'm writing out an investment thesis or have my investing journal. Um, so that's my number one, mate, the orangutan effect. I think it's uh, something that could probably be applied across the whole financial services industry. You know, it's uh, there's almost a tendency to make things more complicated than than they need to be uh, and kind of confuse the end investor. So they need to trust someone to take care of it. So totally. yeah, it's pretty, pretty, um, pretty apt comment, I think. Yeah, well, the thing is you've, as a financial planner, you've got to write down all of your things and explain it to clients anyway, right? So um, I guess- Even then kind of- I get prone to jargon if you've read any of my stuff too. So it's hard to cut out the jargon. Yeah, but you've got to write, like you've got to simplify it. So um, I just think this is it's such an important technique. It's something that, I've written about recently in in terms of how we build a thesis for an investment, just writing it down, identifying holes, reviewing it, identifying holes, uh, and then simplifying. It's this this process, which is really, it brings humility, but it's really important in investing. So, mate, what's your number one? It's kind of an interesting one. It was in the final line of the letter. It's a bit out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the the kind of idea, I'm not sure if you've seen, was it Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, always be closing? Was that what the, you know, the sales pitch was? So Buffett closes with a pitch for people to buy a party boat that he sold by one of his, uh, one of his investee companies. So I think it's a Jimmy Buffett, who's like a Las Vegas singer, Mm -hmm. uh, party boat for sale. And this kind of reminds me of the idea of, you know, Buffett is always outworking. He's always selling you know, he's known for having you know stacks of annual reports in his office. Uh, he's never off. I think is probably the thing there. And in in markets, you don't automatically get rewarded for hard work, but you can't not do the hard work. Which I think that's kind of a reminder of, even if that is just selling. <laughs> I love it. I'm just reading. I'm just reading the line now. Um, for two days only, shareholders will be able to purchase Jimmy's masterpiece at a ten percent discount. Your bargain hunting chairman will be buying a boat. For his family's use, join me. Uh, that's great. I like a party it. Party boat like for a ninety-one-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so my number two is um, not necessarily something that's coming from the recent letter. Uh, it is the idea that Buffett would in, invest in a in a position or a company, imagining that the the stock market would close for five years. So we've we've heard this, um, we've heard this quote before, I'm sure, but it goes. I never attempt to make money on the stock market. I buy on the assumption 
that they could close the market the next day and not reopen it for five years, end quote. And you made the joke just off air a minute ago that maybe that's what people in, uh, Poor in taste, Russia, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's what people in, in some parts of Europe um, might be thinking about. Maybe if they close the stock market for a while, I'll, I'll probably be better off. But um, I think the thing is to keep in mind that, you know, this is another attempt this quote, I guess, is another attempt by Buffett to talk about focusing on the business fundamentals and in turn, the valuation. A lot of us take our signals from price. We see the stock price rise or fall, and we kind of let that enter our, our brain and, and help us um, make a decision. But it's not necessarily the most important thing for you to consider when you're investing. Uh, if you've done the work and you've done your valuation, um, that should be a more important, as um, I guess, uh, factor or, or signal for you and uh, you can just focus on the business um, and its performance year to year. Uh, and really simple yeah, so one. Kind of, yeah. yeah, I think it's kind of linked to my second my second one, which is he kept talking about being a business picker, which yep. is what what you're saying there, rather than a stock picker. You know, yep. most of his most of the assets of Berkshire are in unlisted businesses that they manage. Um, hmm. And I think it, as you were saying, it's reiterating why you're investing. So you're not investing in a stock and the price to go up. You're providing capital to a business to grow. Um, and you know some of those businesses lose money, some of those businesses make money, but you're investing in a business. And you know business has been the most successful way to compound, as you can tell, by a three million percent return. <laughs> yeah, uh, compound wealth over time. Um, properties worked in different periods, but business has been consistent over decades. Yeah, that's right. And it's been consistent um, for many, many markets around the world too. So that's a, that's a really good one um, because it relates to my third one, actually, which is uh, Buffett's, basically his four rules for, for buying businesses. This was first written about in his 1977 letter. Uh, so quite a few years ago now, and it's been kind of modified since. But one of the, one of the things that uh, Warren and Charlie look for is, I quote, businesses with favorable long-term prospects end quote. Now, some people, I think, take that to mean that favorable long-term prospects means that you should find growth stocks, in, like if you did air quotes, growth stocks. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily what he is talking about here. I think what he is talking about is businesses that can compound modestly over a very long period of time, thanks to, thanks to their competitive advantage. And so, Bruce Greenwald uh, wrote about this too in his book, Value Investing. When he, when he, that's the book where he talked about um, earnings power value or EPV. And he talked about knowing where the company's reinvesting its capital. Uh, is it reinvesting inside its moat, inside its, you know, where it's got the competitive advantage? Or is it uh, investing outside of that where value is not very often created? So this is a really interesting thing. In, finding companies with favorable long-term prospects. I mean, there are heaps of examples of this, but I guess the best example would be Geico, um, which is the, um, the insurance company. And um, how much, you know, how long Warren studied that company, um, its competitive advantage in providing low-cost insurance and how long that business has endured. I mean, I think he started buying shares. I, I don't have the days off the top of my head. I think, oh yeah, so here we go. He, um, he wrote an article, and I'll put a link in the show notes, in 1951, and the article was titled The Security I Like Best, and he wrote that for the Commercial and Financial Chronicle, um, and he named Geico as that company, and he still owns the business 30, uh, 71 years later. So He owns all of it now, doesn't he? Yeah, that's it. He owns all of it. Exactly. So, hell of an investment, um, and that's just about focusing on companies that can compound and keep compounding for an incredibly long period of time. And I think that's probably more a description of quality. You know, everyone sees them as a traditional value investor, but if you mm. look at the portfolio of assets he holds, then they're not value stocks. They're not they're not what you'd perceive as being cheap. No. Um, he's more looking for very. If you read through that letter, it's very much about cash flow, real earnings. He's very quick to you know talk about fake earnings that that people are kind of what's extraordinary is being expanded to. Um, a lot of different areas that you'd never expect. So yeah, I think it's very much about quality. Yep. Um, I kind of, this is probably an extension of the last one. So the third point was, um, you know, Buffett's always quoted for recommending people go into index funds. Um, but the way he manages capital is the complete opposite. Um, he's a, effectively a private equity investor. So he's looking to take control over businesses or businesses that he can exert controlling, but also making sure, even if he doesn't have control, that quality management is running those businesses. 
uh, and manage them in incredibly well. So I think that's you know applying a private equity approach to a public market investment, which you probably hear a lot. But um, mm. yeah, it's it's really interesting because I've heard um, people you know question, and some people have done the calculations to show that if Warren had just invested his capital uh, in index funds as opposed to treasury bills or cash, how much more money he would have made. Um, yeah. Because he would have been, and he would have been taking his own advice. And actually, this we can riff on this for a second because my number four is actually stay invested. Um, there was a line in there about uh, Berkshire's $144 billion of cash and equivalents. Which, US 144, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> so, which he said is about a half of a percent of the publicly held national debt, which is an incredibly huge number. Um, and he says that Charlie and I pledged that Berkshire will always hold more than $30 billion of cash and equivalents because they never want to be dependent on the kindness of strangers. But he goes, but then he questions, but 144 billion? He says, nor, uh, he goes, this imposing sum, I assure you, is not some deranged expression of patriotism, nor have Charlie and I lost our overwhelming preference for business ownership, to your point earlier, Andrew. And he says, indeed, I first manifested my enthusiasm for that 80 years ago. On March 11, 1942, when I purchased three shares of City Services Preferred Stock, the cost was $114.75 and, and re it required all of my savings. Um, later on, he says, um, after my initial plunge, I have always kept at least 80% of my net worth in equities. So that's kind of the phrase and you can read more about it in the letter, but it's to your point, it's actually him investing so much of basically his fund, almost all of it, if he could, um, in equities of private and public companies, it's, yeah, I mean, not a lot of people can do that and do it well for a very long period of time, right? Yeah, exactly. I think he even talked about investing the pension fund that uh, Berkshire Hathaway's <laughs> employees yeah. get into into the same companies that, that Berkshire holds as well. So um, I think stay, I mean, the only, you could, there's, you know, areas where you can time the market but the key i mean we talk about asset allocation a lot the key mm -hmm. is staying exposed to companies and businesses over an extended period of time um mm -hmm. and and making sure they're growing even modestly and that's that's the case right now a lot of investors um are now thinking oh well i'll go to cash to protect myself from this volatility in the stock market um it's probably the opposite you know if you have a good investment plan or you've you've got any type of plan really your plan should probably be like well if the equities or the share portion of my portfolio falls, I should probably rebalance and invest more in that side of my business, uh, in my portfolio, not the opposite. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is an example of someone that's, you know, the, the famous phrase, you know, be greedy when others are fearful. I imagine that of this 144 billion, surely he'll find somewhere to put some of this money over the next 12 months. But what's your number four, mate? Number four was true diversification, I think. So he talked about his four giants for his big four and automatically, you know, we kind of think big four banks, you know, yep. they make up 25% of the index. People, many people still think holding four different banks gives you diversification of, of revenue. Uh, I just like, I think the Berkshire approach is to real diversification of re revenue drivers and return drivers. So their four business models are, or four key businesses are incredibly different as you said geico the insurance and the statutory fund which they invest mm -hmm. apple is one of his largest he owns five percent of apple i think that's one of the largest private owners of apple but yep. um he's also owns a railroad system and i think the biggest energy network in a privately owned energy network in the u.s as well yeah um so it's real diversification you know it's not just buying a heap of financials and a heap of materials like you end up in Australia, but all different parts of the supply chain, all different parts of the American economy. Mm. Yeah. He makes a point in the, in the letter to say that, um, you know, he, Berkshire wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for the American economy. Um, but not, not vice versa. You know um, he says how, you know, fortuitous it was that Berkshire was set up in the United States and they do have a, an advantage of being in a fantastic economy, which is very well diversified. Whereas our economy is pretty heavily, heavily tilted towards financials, towards the construction sector and, and resources. Um, so you've got to make a more of a conscious effort, I guess, here if you're an investor in Australia to actively think about where the revenue of your portfolio companies are coming from. Um, I'm sure this is something that Warren and Charlie think about quite often. Um, that's a really interesting one. And I, and I totally agree. And one, my final one 
number five for me is actually something that you brought up through, which is his focus on owner earnings. Um, the, the, the formula can actually get quite complicated. When, when Buffett first talked about it, um, I don't think cash flow statements were actually a thing. Uh, they weren't reported to investors. So things have changed since then when they just had the income statement and the balance sheet. But the, the owner earnings calculation, <clears throat> pardon me, is basically just a focus on the increase in book value. So the assets of a company plus the dividends that are received by investors. And so that's very different to um, the net income or net earnings and the net profit that you see on an income statement today, which basically takes into account um, a bunch of different stuff, including non-cash um, revenue and non-cash charges. And so Warren makes a conscious effort, it would seem, to adjust for a bunch of different things like depreciation, amortization, um, non-cash items, and trying to find the difference between growth capital expenditure and maintenance capital expenditure. So what I mean by that is, if you have a business that requires a lot of maintenance capital expenditure, that doesn't increase the value of um, the assets on the balance sheet. Only the extra spending for growth as uh, for growth investments actually increases the value of the assets on the balance sheet. Um, and this is the way Warren looks at a lot of the, the companies, including his own, and talks about book value quite a lot. And it's kind of in contrast to what a lot of investors focus on these two uh, these days, which is the top line or revenue, and um, you know the gross profit margin, which I do focus on quite a bit. So it's a good reminder that he's done all of this compounding over many decades while focusing on metrics that are very actually simple to um, follow. Uh, it's basically the cash that you receive as an investor and the increase of the value of the assets on the balance sheet. So I thought that was just worth mentioning in here because he, he touched on that and some of the companies uh, that he spoke about. It was like the Apple comment, wasn't it, where you got about mm. 800 million in dividends, but he was entitled to 5.4 billion in earnings that are effectively, you know, increasing the exactly. value of Apple. And then his his shareholding went up because of repurchases or buybacks by the company. So, yep. Yep. Uh, my here you go. Sorry, I was going to say it's the same thing with Coca Cola. He's earning over 500 million dollars a year in dividends, right? So, yeah, yeah, huge, huge. My last one's we've got a bit of an ESG tilt. Um, mm. <laughs> which is, you know, he's hit very heavily with, I think he got hit with a couple of uh, board requests last year about uh, equality and uh, ESG reporting. And I think there's a kind of reminder in his, in his piece that, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of new companies coming into, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's mining, whether it's renewable energy, mm. but the incumbents are going to win in the decarbonisation. You know, there's talking about trillion needed every year to decarbonise the global economy. So they own basically the biggest energy company in the US. Uh, and that started in coal. Most of the coal, I think, is gone. And it's now one of the biggest renewable energy producers. So similar to railroads, you know, the old fashioned assets are going to still going to be the most important. You can't deliver the amount of goods via drone that you can mm. on a railroad across the country. So I think old fashioned businesses are going to benefit from decarbonization because what? they're the incumbents and be able to invest in the future. What was that? Um, that he had a quote, I'm just trying to flick through the, the letter now where he spoke about, he was, he was making a, a rare, was it a forecast? Um, a prediction. Here you go. He, I quote, um, here I'll venture a rare prediction. BNSF will be a key asset for Berkshire and our country a century from now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this just emphasizing again, the real assets that the company owns and the potential of those um, assets to endure for a very, very long time. Um, and if you think about, you know, Apple with its iOS ecosystem and hardware, it's basically like the railroad for a lot of um, communication on the internet, right? So people, um, I guess, over or underestimate this, the potential of these businesses to compound for a very long period of time. And um, the ESG thing is very, very interesting. Um, over the years, I have heard uh, Buffett make certain quotes about you know equality and those types of things, um, and even maybe his political orientation too. So um, it's fascinating. I was going to reflect on basically the performance for people that haven't read the letter. There's a link in the show notes. Um, since 1940, uh, since 1964 to 2021, the overall gain is 3,641,613%, which sounds incredible next to the 30,209% from the uh, index. But when you break it down, it's 20.1% per year. 
So yes, it's incredibly hard to sustain those types of returns, but it actually seems more, more reasonable for people to do that, even if it's only for, you know, five or 10 years. I mean, not saying that any, any one of us will do this, but um, I just think it's fascinating. And there's so much information out there, Drew, for people to go and learn about how Warren Buffett invests, some of the kind of wisdom that he's distilled. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the interesting things there was he's, he's still underperforming over the last three years too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's, yeah, oh, he's just outperformed in 2021, but uh, two years of our underperformance before that. So even the, rem- sorry, sorry, go on. Even, even the best can have uh, difficult years now and then. Oh, for sure. Um, I remember some comparisons between him and Kathy Wood from ARK um, and seeing the ARK performance chart next to the Berkshire stock price just shooting up to the sky. And then we saw, you know, the last few months, it just comes straight back down. And um, steady as she goes, Berkshire Hathaway is kind of still just compounding away. Um, and I think, you know, if more investors just invested, it's if they were going to invest for 40 or 50 years, uh, it would be incredible um, what you do um, with your time and your money and how your portfolio would change. So some fast, fantastic stuff, mate. Um, Drew Meredith, I know this was a shorter episode. Uh, you're coming to us from the Waddle Partners office down in Melbourne. Um, is there anything that uh, investors should take away from this call if they want to get in touch with you how do they do all that i think my emails or and phone number are always in the show notes i think uh get a, quite a few queries via our website too there's a kind of automatic link there and i actually wrote an article on my takeaways from berkshire's letter which i think will be published tomorrow it'll be i'll we'll put a link to that in there as well yeah great yeah i'll put all the links in the show notes so if you do want to read drew's article and if you want to get in touch with him um you can find all of that info in the show notes Drew Meredith from Water Partners. Mate, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.